Roger, go for the party. Thank you and everybody in the shuttle program. The crew is go for launch. Station, this is Houston. Are you ready for the event? Hello, Houston. We're ready for the event. SEPAO, this is Mission Control Houston. Please call station for a voice check. Station, this is JSCPAO. How do you hear me? JSCPAO, loud and clear. Welcome to the space station. Thank you. Great. Well, welcome and good morning from Houston, and thank you all for joining us today. We have many questions already in the queue for our crew. As a reminder for our media on the phone bridge, Please press star one if you have a question and star two to withdraw your question if it gets answered. All right, let's jump in. Um, we will start with Michael Sheets from CNBC. Hi guys, uh, thanks for taking the questions uh, and I hope you can hear me pretty well up there. Um, I'm curious to hear a little bit more uh, about your experience testing out Crew Dragon in the interim time you've been up there, as well as if you guys feel like you, you're ready to come back now, uh, given the amount of time it's been already, uh, but whether or not this experience is one that you'd, uh, you'd rather be sticking up there or, or coming back down to test out the splashdown. Thanks. Well, Michael, that's a... Uh several questions i'll see if i can remember all of them but i think you know from an on orbit testing standpoint we did habitability testing we tested interfaces we tested emergency com we we tested emergency equipment and uh just generically how we work with uh, the dragon docked on board you know transferring equipment transferring supplies we're going to do a fair amount of that uh, again tomorrow when we return equipment or uh, supplies back to earth uh, so most of that uh, went uh, exactly as we planned. There was a couple little tweaks here and there, but for the most part, we've had pretty good, uh, pretty good luck with with Endeavor as far as uh, on-orbit testing. It's performed just like it did for launch uh, and uh, rendezvous. So we expect nothing different for the splashdown. Um, our experience up here has been uh, like. I think every space flight for, for most of us is a once-in-a-lifetime experience, and, and this one probably is a great uh, topper, at least for me personally, you know, just to be able to live and work aboard Space Station, uh, a facility that the three of us all helped build uh, in uh, during our, the shuttle uh, flights, and uh, just has been great to be a crew member with Chris and Bob. Uh, on the day, on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, supporting ISS operations, supporting science, supporting maintenance, the spacewalks, the four spacewalks that these guys did, the robotics that we did, uh, it was just uh, just an incredible experience and one that I will absolutely never forget and I'll always cherish. Thank you. Um, so next up, we have Russell Pounds from Pacific Rim Media. Good morning. Uh, I'm not sure which one of you may have had this experience, but uh, there's a quote I've always appreciated from Arthur C. Clarke. It says, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. So the question is, what experience did uh, you have that gave you that aha feeling and embodies that notion of uh, the first gasp of delight? Thanks. It's an interesting question, I, I think, to, you know, really put something out there as so advanced technologically that we would really have to describe it as magic in the way that it works. Uh, I think for all three of us, uh, you know, I, I'm personally from the Show Me State in Missouri, so if uh, something like that was to happen to me and I was baffled by it, uh, uh, we wouldn't be scientists and engineers if we didn't strive to understand what it was. And so there's that initial moment of wonder when you see something uh, that, that you don't quite understand, and then we strive to understand it. I think that's really our calling as, as uh, folks that, you know, seek out and, and continue to try to find the answers to, you know, unknown questions 
questions, anything that we found like that, uh, we would, you know, we would pound flat until we did understand it. Uh, those sorts of situations probably for us um, happen mostly when it comes to things that don't go exactly right. We think we fully understand something and it doesn't proceed the way that we expected it to. We have a, a failure in a piece of equipment or in an operation and it's a failure of the imagination. And then we strive to take it apart bit by bit. I think every space program has had its share uh, of those sorts of events that we had to really dig down and, and try to understand what we didn't understand um, and make sure we had a handle on it before we continued with operations. Uh, I think probably the three of us, uh, uh, at least from a technological perspective, don't believe in magic. Thanks, Bob. So now we have Chris Davenport from the Washington Post. Hey guys, uh, hope you're well. Um, quick question. Uh, so obviously the first water landing since 1975. I was curious if you have spoken uh, to any of the Apollo astronauts about that and what advice they may have given you. Uh, and then also I wonder if you could talk a little bit of your training and how much of it was dedicated to a splashdown, just given the differences from a shuttle landing. Thanks. Hey, good morning, Chris. Um, we didn't talk specifically with Apollo astronauts, but uh, I remember specifically when I was still, uh, before I was even assigned to this flight, working at uh, flight operations, reading the uh, after action reports from the Skylab astronauts, which was a little bit more applicable in that those flights were a little bit longer. And, uh, you know, the water landing portion of it is pretty challenging from a physiological standpoint just after coming back from uh, being in microgravity for on the order of uh, one to two months. I think the longest Skylab mission was uh, close to three months, uh, which is very similar to what Bob and I uh, are are doing. Uh, obviously, there, there was some challenges uh, post splashdown, you know, folks didn't feel feel well. And, uh, you know, that is the way it is with a water landing, even if you're not uh, deconditioned like we're going to be. So uh, we, we think what we need to do is uh, do our fluid loading properly. We've uh, exercised uh, very hard while we've been up here, and uh, we're just trying to put ourselves in the best posture to be able to, to deal with the, those effects. And uh, we'll just see where it goes from there. Um, the ground teams are, are fully aware of uh, the challenges of the water landing and, and what it does uh, to the human body. And you know we'll just take it from there once we get on board the ship. We've got the, the flight surgeons on board that will be able to help us as well. So. All those things are uh, have been thought about and are in place, and uh, you know, other than that, it's uh, just time to go give it a give it a try and uh, and see how it goes. All right, we'll go to Eric Berger from Ars Technica. Hi guys, uh, looking forward to seeing you come home hopefully this weekend. Um, a couple questions. First of all, is it true that technical documents refer to the toilet on board Crew Dragon as Komodo Dragon? And how would you characterize the habitable volume inside Dragon? Like, would you be comfortable in there for, for more than a couple of days with two or three people, or is it kind of cramped? Well, Eric, uh, good to talk to you. I, I think we're not familiar with that uh, Komodo Dragon reference for our on-orbit procedures, so that's uh, not what we call it. The only other name other than Crew Dragon we've used is Endeavor. And we really appreciate the SpaceX guys uh, allowing us or being comfortable with us uh, putting a, a moniker on, on board their ship. It's something that we really uh, cherish the opportunity to do. And as far as the habitable, vo habitable volume inside of the Dragon capsule, it's uh, it's relatively small. Uh, so if you tried to put a full crew of uh, seven like we had on the space shuttle days uh, inside that volume, it, it would uh, be a stay in your seat sort of a situation. But uh, with three or four people, uh, the operations normally will, you know, your job will be to be in your seat for the ascent and the, the docking and then, of course, the, the splashdown. And so there's plenty of room in those locations. And, and around the interior of the vehicle, you know, there is some uh, some spaces that can folks can get out of their seats and kind of have their own small area to, to be in. So I wouldn't say it's a, a phone booth sort of a, a densely packed, but it definitely is cozy if you uh, were to get up to four people. All right, now we have James Rogers from Fox News. 
Good morning, boys. So um, I have a quick question with regards to the splashdown. Two questions, really. Obviously, the splashdown is such an iconic moment in terms of the, you know, in terms of space missions we've been seeing that, you know, so. Now, what's your first experience of watching splashdowns on TV? And also, kind of related to that, you know, we have this new spacecraft, you know, it's been designed to perform better in a splashdown scenario. How does what this capsule offer kind of differs to differ to the you know to the capsules that we've seen used in previous splashdowns? Okay. Um yeah, we had a hard time understanding the, the question, but I think uh, just in relation to splashdown, as, as far as uh, what we would experience, is that what you were asking? Yeah, and also just in terms of, you know, kind of how does, the, how does this capsule differ in terms of, you know, the prior capsules that we used in, 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 in splashdown scenarios? I know a lot of design attention has been paid to that. Um, so how is it different? How is it better? Okay, we I think we got it that time. Um, yeah, the uh, the recovery of Dragon uh, after splashdown is that there'll be uh, a couple of uh, what we call fast boats will come up to the to the capsule at that point and make sure uh, everything is safe on the outside of the capsule uh, for it to be uh, hoisted on board the uh, recovery ship. And then at that point, the recovery ship is is moving in and in communications with the fast boats. And once uh, everybody gives the uh, thumbs up that we're ready to be hoisted aboard, it'll get lifted aboard you know, by a crane and cradled on board the uh, aft portion of the ship. And then at that point, once it's secure on, on the uh, back deck of the ship, then they can open the hatch and uh, it'll be time for us to get out. Hopefully that answered your question. Thank you, Doug. Uh, so next up, we have David Curley with Discovery Channel. Uh, crew, Dragon Crew, thank you, and Commander of the Station, thank you for taking the questions. Uh, everybody knows there are parts of flight that are extreme. It is reentry. In this case, the chief engineer of SpaceX says he's a little bit worried about plasma and potentially getting into the Super Draco pods. Bob, you said you weren't nervous. You're a lot closer now. What do you think? And Chunk, did you just say you're going to have a bag ready, which is completely understandable at Splashdown? Thank you. Well, howdy. I think, uh, you know, as we get closer, I think we really focus more and more on our preparations uh, to be ready for the Splashdown activities. Uh, we spent the day today working through the onboard training that will refamiliarize us with the Splashdown activities, uh, what our responsibilities will be, the, the things that we'll monitor. And I know that the, uh, the SpaceX team, the chief engineer there, and of course the NASA team are, are all looking closely at all the, the things that could possibly uh, that they wish they had more information on or that uh, that they feel the most uncertain about and and they share those with us on a routine basis we got an update on the flight readiness review activities and uh, i know that the the chief engineer's job is to make that list of things that that are areas of concern and then uh, kind of balance that that risk with uh, what they currently know and, and with going forward and, and that information's all been shared with us and you know splashdown is closer than it was the last time we were asked questions about it but uh, i still don't feel nervous about it and and really we're focused on the things that we'll need to do to be as safe as possible as as we come back and uh, it does take a little bit of time, so I'll answer for Doug and say that we'll both have uh, the appropriate hardware ready should uh, we start feeling you know, a little bit uh, sick, sick on board while we're, we're in the vehicle uh, after splashdown. But uh, we know the team is uh, going to get us pulled up and on board the ship uh, relatively quickly. And so uh, we're expecting to, to be as prepared as we can be and have a really good feeling of about, about being kind of under control as we get through all that. All right, next up we have Andrea Leinfelder from the Houston Chronicle. Hi guys, uh, looking forward to having you back in Houston. Um, my question is also about splashdown. Um, you know, the vehicle pretty much lands itself, so I'm curious what you guys think you'll be doing, what you think that experience will be like, you know, 
um, if you'll be monitoring anything or looking out the windows or just holding on. Uh, thanks. Yeah, for the um, free flight portion of the uh, flight, in other words, after we uh, undock and phase our way back towards the uh, deorbit burn and the reentry, um, we'll spend a good share of that sleeping and then uh, monitoring the systems uh, prior to and after we wake up. Then once we wake up, we will uh, eat fluid load, go through suit up, and then uh, work our way into the uh, entry portion of the flight and then the deer but burn or deer but burn then entry so uh, we'll be fairly busy when we're awake uh, throughout the whole process and and then those last uh, probably two and a half to three hours will be very busy as we get suited up uh, strapped into our seats and then we'll be monitoring all the uh, different systems of the vehicle ensuring that it's doing what it's supposed to be doing as we work our way back towards uh, Florida and then uh, it it carries on all the way down through splashdown. There are very key milestones that we have to go through that have to happen in sequence and in order and on time in order to, for everything to uh, go the way it's supposed to. And if, if not, we, we along with uh, Mission Control out in uh, Hawthorne, California, the SpaceX Mission Control will be there to assist or to intervene if they need to do as well. So there's, uh, it will be very busy. There won't be a lot of looking out the window, uh, certainly at that point. Um, where we sit in the vehicle, we can see through those forward windows uh, somewhat, but uh, mostly we'll be focused on the displays and the systems of Dragon. We'll go to Gio Benitez from ABC News. Bob, Doug, Chris, great to speak with you again and see that you're doing well. Uh, I have two quick questions. The first, we're all looking at that forecast. Are you at all concerned that this storm maybe too close for comfort. And and the second one, Bob, we hear your wife, Megan, she's going to be going up this spring. This is going to be her first dragon flight. What tips do you have for her? Well, I think from a, a weather perspective, just like uh, everybody else on the NASA and SpaceX team, uh, we look forward to the, the weather forecasts that are coming out daily at this point, and they'll even get more frequent as we get closer to the actual splashdown, I think on launch, uh, the departure day, we'll start to get, you know, uh, every six hours, we'll get another forecast, sort of an update. So we're watching those closely, mostly to maintain awareness and, and see the trends and understand what the timeline would be if our uh, recovery out of the water, for example, was delayed a little bit. But we have confidence that the, the teams on the ground are, are, of course, watching that uh, much more closely than we are. And we won't leave the space station without some good landing opportunities in front of us, good splashdown weather uh, in front of us. And so uh, they're keeping us informed, but the lion's share of that work happens uh, on their end. We don't control the weather, and we know we can stay up here longer. There's more chow, and uh, I know the space station program's got more work that we can do for those uh, uh, the, the PIs and other folks that have sent science up here to the space station. As far as uh, my wife goes, uh, she's super excited uh, and to be assigned to a, a SpaceX mission uh, right on the SpaceX capsule up here to the International Space Station. And of course, I'll have a, a lot of tips for her. Uh, a lot of them will be about how life on space station goes. I think that's been the thing that's been more unique rather than the, the capsule itself. I think that's probably where I'll have the most to, to share with her. But uh, I'll definitely have some advice about uh, living inside of Dragon and uh, where best to pack uh, all your personal items so that you can uh, get to them conveniently. Uh, because if you, just like any trip that you make, if you if you pack things appropriately, it can be a, a very fun trip. If you uh, pack everything at the, the bottom of the big van that you take when you go on vacation and you got to get it all out uh, one item at a time at various times, it can be uh, it can be tiring and can and eat into your enjoyment on the trip. And so I'll definitely have some tips for her, but uh, it'll be hard to uh, tampen out all the excitement that she has uh, with, with any, any suggestions I have. All right. Now we have Joey Roulette from Reuters. For doing this, um, what, what about the process of returning do you and uh, the SpaceX team wish you had more information on? And um, earlier it was said that you'll have the appropriate hardware ready in case you guys get sick. 
is that something as simple as a paper bag, or does Crew Dragon have, like, or, or the flight suits, do they have some kind of actual hardware for anticipating sickness things? Uh, I didn't get your first question, but I, I certainly can answer your second one. Um, yeah, the, the appropriate hardware, uh, just like on an airliner, uh, there are bags if you need them, and we'll have those handy. We'll probably have some towels handy as well. And, uh, you know, if, if that needs to happen, it certainly wouldn't be the first time that that's happened in a space vehicle. It will be the first time in this particular vehicle if we do, but... Uh, not in not uh, not the first time by any stretch uh, as folks at flying space know that sometimes going uphill can be uh, a little bit uh, ha have an effect on your system and sometimes coming downhill is, is the same way so we'll, we'll just have to see how it goes and we'll certainly let you know um what was your first question again the first question was what about the process of returning do you and the spacex team wish you had more information on Yeah, I think, uh, you know, the biggest challenge, and it was that way with shuttle, is just the weather that we need in order to uh, return home. You know, shuttle had some fairly uh, significant uh, weather criteria relative to Dragon or capsule vehicle, but it was, but, but we still have weather to deal with. And of course, anybody who's lived on the Gulf Coast or anywhere uh, in, in the south along the coast in the United States knows that uh, August and September are tough months to deal with with the hurricanes that uh, always tend to crop up and 2020 seems to be a pretty active year by all by all accounts so I think the biggest thing we'd all like to know is just uh, the weather but you know as with any tropical system there even with today's technology somewhat unpredictable they wobble they move the center moves you know, and you have uh, fronts that affect them and where they go, and that, that obviously has an effect on uh, our landing areas. So, if anything, just we'd like to be able to predict the weather a little bit better than we can, but we have uh, some of the best people in the business uh, working on this for us, and uh, if the weather is not good, we, we won't try to leave tomorrow. We'll leave on a different day when it is. Let's go to Marsha Dunn from the Associated Press. Yes, hi. Um, for Bob, I'm wondering if you had a hunch before your flight that Megan would be riding your same dragon to orbit so soon after your flight. And, and secondly, um, have you or Doug been in touch directly with Elon Musk during the flight? And if so, what's he telling you? What's he asking? Um, is he being reassuring about Splashdown? Thank you. Uh, of course, I think, uh, Marsha, we all have uh, inklings or hints that uh, things might be in work as we go forward. But uh, as anyone uh, who's will tell you who's been a part of the flight assignment process before, I know Chris and I have uh, both assigned people to that uh, that role. And, you know, really the decisions are kind of made and final uh, really towards the very end of it. And so while there are hints of what might happen in the future, you know, we don't, uh, we don't count our chickens until they're hatched, so to speak, with respect to uh, uh, flight assignments. So while I had a hint, uh, you know, we always wait for the, the final data before we go forward with it. As far as uh, Elon goes, we did uh, spend uh, some time with him uh, pre-launch. And of course, with the Demo-1 mission, we were able to uh, spend some time with him as well. Uh, once we've uh, gotten on orbit, we have heard from the, the management team uh, at SpaceX. I, I know I, we've Gwen reached out to us, and uh, Hans reached out to us, and of course, uh, Lee Rosen, uh, and then their ops team lead, Chris Young. So we've, we've definitely been in contact with the entire spectrum of uh, folks on the SpaceX side. Uh, and they've all been, you know, it's not reassuring is the wrong word, but, uh, you know, they certainly have confidence in the uh, equipment and the plan that we have in front of us, and they continue to tweak and make updates to make it as best as it possibly can uh, be for the splashdown that uh, we're going to go through here in uh, uh, just a couple of days. And so I think that's probably the thing that really is uh, most impressive about that team is that willingness to continue to improve, to continue to make corrections. There are things that have changed. Uh, minor things, but uh, things that uh, they've thought thought a lot more about and uh, tested uh, on the ground prior to uh, our splashdown. But since we've launched, and uh, we've gotten some updates on those things, and it's uh, it's the mark of a good team that continues to strive to make the product, make the event as uh, as successful as it can possibly be. Now we have 
Robert Perlman from Collect Space. Hi, guys. Um, the first spaceship named Endeavour splashed down on the Apollo 15 mission on August 7, 1971, just a few days and 49 years after your expected splashdown. Can you reflect a little bit on the legacy of spaceships named Endeavour, including your own? And do you intend or hope for Crew 2 to continue to use the name, or was that a call sign just for your flight? Well, the name Endeavour uh, that we used uh, was specifically just for this vehicle. Uh, you know, it was kind of a tradition where the, the Soyuz crews uh, named their vehicles, and Apollo crews, Gemini crews, Mercury crews named their vehicles, and uh, a lot of folks thought that it would be a good tradition to continue. Um, so that's, that's what we did. And it, it was probably a little more personal for Bob and I since our first flights, along with Chris uh, also, uh, was on Endeavour, Shuttle Endeavour, and uh, that's kind of where it started with us, and uh, we just thought that that was appropriate. But it's it's neat that it has a legacy that goes all the way back to Apollo, and uh, honestly, I didn't I didn't realize the uh, significance as far as how close it was to splashdown as, as what hopefully we'll be doing here in a couple of days. So that, that's kind of also just kind of icing on the cake, I think. But we we really thought that that name was a uh, was the name to use and it and it, it really means a lot personally to bob and i and uh you know as bob said before we really appreciate spacex uh affording us that opportunity to name uh, our capsule endeavor and we have time for one maybe two more questions so let's go with lauren grush from the verge Hi, thank you so much for taking my question. Um, when Scott Kelly returned from his trip in space, he said he was looking forward to throwing himself in his pool when he got home. I know your mission has been much shorter than his, but anything in particular y'all are looking forward to when you get on the ground? Thanks. Thanks, Lauren. I think for me and uh, uh, probably for Doug as well, I think we're really excited to see our families. Um, you know, my, my son is six years old, and I, I can tell from the videos that I get and talking to him on the phone that uh, he's changed a lot even in the just a uh, couple of months that we've been up here. And so that's the thing I'm most looking forward to is, of, of course, uh, uh, seeing my family, my wife, uh, and my son. All right, and this will be our last question. We have Mark Corot from Aviation and Space Technology. Thank you. Uh, my question is for Chris. Um, how would you assess the um, what Bob and Doug brought to your mission in terms of contributions to science and technology development and even just crew camaraderie? Yeah, hi, Mark. Uh, it's a simple math equation. There was one and then there were three. Uh, so we, we effectively tripled our ability to get work done, and with all three of us having been here before, it was in short order that we were running at full steam and, and getting all the uh, science objectives, as many science objectives completed as, as we could. Uh, and with that, it was lonely conversations I had with myself at dinner prior to their arrival, and, and with these last two months, it's been fantastic to have uh, buddies at the chow table to reflect on the day, think about tomorrow, and talk about uh, world events and, and uh, uh, that sort of thing. So I, they'll def I'll definitely miss, uh, miss them when they head back. Well, thank you so much. Bob, Doug, and Chris, and your two special guests over there to your right. We look forward to your upcoming return aboard Crew Dragon Endeavor. And Chris, we will see you back on Earth in October. We've enjoyed following your missions from the ground. Thanks to our participants today, and this concludes our event. Station, this is Houston ACR. That concludes our event as we count down to 20 continuous years of humans living and working on the International Space Station. Thank you. And thanks to everyone that participated in the station. We're going to now go back and resume operational calm.